starting and creating your own little art project, your own creative project is one of the best ways to both learn and also to have something at the end that you're really proud of. It gives us purpose as artists. And I think it's one of the best things you can do to really consolidate and figure out what you're about and learn how to challenge yourself. These types of art projects can obviously take many forms. This could just be a series of images. It could be a situation where you're trying to create your own printed sketchbook, your own book to sell, your own art book. You could be creating a series of cards, of trading cards. You could actually be trying to productize your art in some way. Make a tabletop game, make a comic book, make something that people can buy, something that you can create that's yours, that you can share with the world. You could also just be trying to create a world building tome, trying to push your skills. And even if maybe you're not trying to create art, maybe you're trying to apply for a job, what you're trying to do is build a folio piece, try and build a set of things that can go together because that also is a good way to direct your energy. Whatever it is, I think one of the tricks is that we frequently have a lot of motivation in the beginning to start these projects. We often really like starting things and feeling that creative energy of, look, this is going to be amazing. It feels like there's an endless set of possibilities of what can be. I think starting a project is one of the best times. But the interesting thing is that often the way we start is a big part of how likely we are to succeed in the end. And in this video, what I really want to talk about are some top strategies, some top keys to really understanding how to best start your art projects so that you have a good chance of actually finishing them. All right, welcome to the Visual Scholar Podcast. My name is Tim McBurney. I've been a professional working artist for over 20 years. And on this show, we're all about demystifying the worlds of art, creativity, and productivity so that you can get better faster and enjoy your artistic journey. I've had a fair amount of experience managing and creating projects from the beginning to the end. I have created tabletop board games like Mythic Arcana that I've taken from an idea to kickstarting it and getting it published, getting it made. I've also had to do the project management on a lot of the comics that I've worked on, being the writer, doing the lettering, doing basically everything. So I have a lot of experience here and I've also seen a lot of the traps that students Students and aspiring artists tend to fall for. These things and these key ideas that I'm going to talk about can often be the difference between you succeeding or essentially probably having failed before you even begin. Okay, so the first thing here that I think is really critical is, you have to forgive me, this is a little bit technical and it's very easy that you might you know, sort of just click off and turn this off because I'm going to start talking about some sort of technical planning stuff here. But this really is the crux of this. So hopefully you'll, you know, stick with me through this and, and I'll be able to explain to you why I think this is so important for your ultimate creative expression and for you to really be a properly, fully realized artist who can make great things. But the first thing we have to do is get real about what we're creating. We have to think about very mundane things like deliverables. What are the assets that we're going to create? Now, I'll use a couple of examples to kind of illustrate the point because this is at first a very simple concept, but it can get very complicated as we progress. So again, bear with me and we'll try and explain how this kind of actually works and relates to creative projects and expression. But we have the thing called a deliverable. And this is something if you've worked in games or creative industries, you kind of hear this a lot. This, this is the thing you actually hand over. So if I'm a freelancer and I'm making an illustration, you know, what I'm going to ask the client is like, what, what is my deliverable here? And they're like, well, you need to hand us a finished JPEG or a finished Photoshop file or a finished TIFF file. It needs to be CMYK or RGB. It needs to be this resolution. We want it compressed or not compressed. It needs to be these specifications, the, this ratio, this resolution. We need this many pixels. Um, you know, these are the kind of things that we talk about as a deliverable. And, and it's a very defined thing. It's like, this is what I'm making. This is what I'm doing. Um, you know, and I, that's what I kind of need to hand over them. And that's the thing where like, I hand that over and then I have done the job. I've delivered the finished thing. 
If you're working in games, this is how we define it. And this is separate to the process that we use to get that. And we'll break these things down a little bit. Very, very important distinctions here. But in games, again, a deliverable might be a finished 3D model that is game ready. Um, and that's your deliverable as part of the process, right? That's actually the thing you're delivering. The assets are the things that are kind of getting built from those deliverables to a certain degree. But the deliverable is, if you're working on a project, is, is either a thing that you are going to move to the next stage or consider done, right? It's like that's the thing that you're actually aiming for. Now, the process by which you get to that deliverable is something separate, and that's where you have your internal process for how you do that. Now, as part of an illustration brief, you might have a number of these sub-deliverables. You might have the situation where it says, Okay, but these are the this is the main thing we're creating, but I also want you to send me three black and white sketches. I want you to send me the image when you finish the drawing, and I want you to send it to me when you've kind of finished the rough color before we kind of finish it off. And those are also things that we're defining as stages along the way. They're milestones. So there's a couple of different ways that we define this. We have the finished assets that we're going to build, and then we have our internal process and stages along the way that we're actually going to define as internal deliverables. These are things that we are going to check in. Now, let's use the idea of a comic book as an example. And again, um, I, I kind of feel drawn to give you more examples but, but and, and sort of mix it up, but I think it'll get a bit confusing. So let's, let's stick with something really simple. And I'll use as an example the type of book that I would have to create for a French comic book publisher. Now, in this case, I need 46 finished pages. Now, the deliverable that I create in that instance is probably something that maybe doesn't have lettering or, you know, maybe if I don't do color, it doesn't have color. That's kind of my deliverable and I kind of wash my hands of it. But let's imagine we're doing the whole thing. Let's imagine you're creating your own version of it and it's you who has to deliver all these files to the printer. Probably what you need is a finished version of that page, probably in CMYK, probably at a particular set of, you know, uh, dimensions and resolution. You probably also need to create a little bit of bleed on the outside so that you know it can actually be printed. You need to think about the color profile. There's a whole bunch of stuff you need to do, but this is the file you're actually gonna send people. X number of pages, 46 colored pages that are colored, lettered, and have everything. They're basically ready to go. You can press print once those get sort of put into the file. Your printer may say, no, we actually want you to build it all into a PDF for us, or they may want to build it themselves, who knows. What you also need for a comic book is a cover. You need a cover for your comic book and you probably need um, a couple of other sort of images that will go along with it. Often you have, you know, another image that might go on the back cover if your cover's not wraparound or if your cover's a wraparound cover. Again, you might need some way to kind of block and make sure there's text there. Any, either way, you probably need a, a finished cover that, you know, kind of functions. You also need... Um, the image that goes just inside the front cover. I always forget what that thing's called, but there's a bit of paper that connects the cover with the first page. And it's kind of like a, a front um, sort of piece to the book. And you often just need an image there, unless it's white. It can be white, but you're often going to be asked for that. The other thing you probably need is a logo for your book, right? What's the logo and where does it go? It goes on the spine, goes on the front. You need to design that, you need to think about, uh, is that logo going to work there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You also probably need a sort of introductory page image. There's often an image on the first page where you have all of the copyright information. And if this is your book, you probably have to put all the copyright information in there, written and drawn by you, right? Edited by you, um, you know, copyright you, blah, blah, blah. Um, and again, an image there. Like why? It's just sort of something that is typically a convention. So those are like the things I need. If I have a cover, if I have all the interior pages, if I have uh, some sort of image to go on the, you know, just inside the cover, and if I have like an intro page image, then I'm like, that's done, I'm good. I got all the assets that I need. Now, obviously, you don't just manifest them out of nowhere. They come from somewhere. You need to create through a process of your own how you actually get there. And this is where the idea of internal deliverables come in so if you're looking at um you know a board game or like here i've got a copy of mythic arcana if you're looking on the video sort of version of this otherwise this is a tabletop game that i created it has and this is a little bit different but i won't dive too much into this but it has you know 76 tarot style cards tarot sized cards four reference cards 12 dice and one rule book so 
we kind of had to create all that stuff. We also have to create the box and we have to create, you know, the, the way that the box looks inside, right? It's got sort of gloss on it and, it and it's got some gold foil on it. We have to kind of create all those assets. We have to prototype the, and this essentially the, the box design and layout is a file. It's a Photoshop file, basically, that what we deliver. We have to design that. We have to think about what goes where. So this process, and typically for a design process, there's um, a series of steps. There's like that initial phase. There's like the prototyping phase. There's where you sort of start production. There's where you finish production. Many, many phases. The game is probably a little bit more complicated in terms of how we do that. That's probably a whole podcast episode unto itself. Let me know if you want that one, right? How do we actually do this? What are all the steps we used? But if we think about our comic book project, that's a little bit simpler, I think, to define. Probably what you need is, and we're kind of working back, and if you're working this out yourself, what I'm really talking about here is a skeleton that we're building, a scaffolding of deliverables that's so important. And this is the first stage that I really always talk about and I call the skeleton. You need to skeleton your project. The skeleton is a list of all the deliverables and a, a view of what you're going to basically build your finished assets upon. It's just a list of all the different stages you're going to take and the things you need to do in order to get this thing finished. For a comic book, you're probably going to need a storyboard for each page. You're going to need the script or some way to you know do all the writing on the page. For a French comic book, typically what you have is the storyboard actually has the writing on it. The lettering is frequently done by the artist by hand on the you know, inked page. So that's kind of how I do it, right? The storyboard is the script. It has the finished script there. You might have to think about whether or not you need a deliverable for a script and all the, you know, sub deliverables and milestones that would go along to you creating a script. Do you just storyboard it yourself and write stuff as you go? Um, do you write a script first? Is it full script? Do you just have an outline? How do you do it? These are obviously, you know, situations where the, the questions multiply, and you really need to think about how you're going to do this. Now, this is important and it may seem overwhelming, but as we'll progress through this, we'll talk about why this is so critical. But you may have things before that that are very specific to your process and how you go about proving to yourself or getting funding, pitching this book to someone before you even start producing it. Let's again imagine that you're just doing it for yourself. For me, I kind of like a little pitch a little set of pitch images and ticks and, and things that I know so that I'm confident this thing's actually going to go somewhere. And typically what those are are that I need a little synopsis. I need a little written version of what the story is so that I can remember what it is. And so I can maybe pitch it to other people and say, I've got this story. It's about this, this, and this. Does this sound interesting? And, you know, again, that's just for what it's worth. I think that's good to have. Um, you know, and then I need uh, some sketches of all the main characters and maybe other things that are important, they're there just for me to prove, like, what does this look like? Is this actually going to be interesting? And then what I like to do is, you know, look at least one, but ideally, you know, one to three finished images that are there to pitch this idea, to show why this idea is cool, why this story is cool, why this story is exciting. One of those could be a cover. Developing the cover first, even if you have to redo it in the end, is a good way to get a handle on what this book is about. But either way, I like to have a rough idea of what the story is in prose form that's actually written and finalized. I need to have all the characters at least sketched. And then I need to create some pitch art to prove to myself so that I can show it to people and be like, look, does this seem cool? Is this interesting? What are the key elements? What are the key story points in this story? If I don't kind of have those, then it's very hard for me to go and start because often what you find with a comic is, you know, you're leading up to things, right? You might have a very exciting bit in the beginning to kind of get things started. And then, you know, often you kind of dip down a little bit. You establish the action, the characters, your ordinary world, etc. You kind of tone things down. And often that's what you're working on in the beginning is like things are like not as exciting. And you're sort of thinking, hey, but I got this really cool climax. I got this really cool thing in the middle. But, you know, you've never drawn it. And so you don't really know whether it's that cool. Having some good tent poles there, let's say, to really hold everything up is, is critical, I think, just for maintaining motivation. So that's what I like to do. Next, what I want is a storyboard and I need to you know build the storyboard for the page. And then what I'm going to do is create the finished lines and the color and then all the effects in the final sort of page. So what I'm talking about when I come to skeletoning something is to figure out all of those different stages along the way and to create 
some structure, some skeleton that you're going to use to basically place finished assets upon. The way this works for me is I create a set of folders. So my you know series of folders for a comic book project would have like pitch development materials and it's just a blank page. But what I might have is like I might actually create a blank page in there that says character designs. I might create another one that's like pitch image one, pitch image two, pitch image three, and you know anything else I might need. Now for the deliverables, I might also have a folder that says you know final deliverables in that you know, in my sort of larger project folder that says, here's the cover, right? Here's my extra imagery, right? And then I'll create a blank page for, here's my kind of, you know, front page image, right? Where you've got all your information. Here's the image that I'm going to use for, you know, inside the cover. And what I'll also create is, you know, 46 blank pages that uh, in my case, I'll be using a template because I've already done this before, but you would probably just create blank pages that have, um, the right resolution, the right dimensions with bleed for printing. And you'd make them in, you know, the right format for whatever comic you're creating. You kind of need to know that before you start. You just do. No way around it. Uh, very problematic and hard to reformat that stuff. You also need to make sure your cover is all these formats. So figure this stuff out first. Um, now, you may be saying, uh, you may have already turned this off because you're like, this sounds super boring, man. I just want to draw my cool project. But Again, it's often these things, unfortunately, that will define your ability to succeed in the long run, You're knowing the ins and outs of a project. Now, creating a board game is very similar. We need to prototype what the images look like. We need to prototype the art. We need to get all of this stuff figured out. And often what I actually do with a, with a board game is I do create blank versions of every card and I do you know, a really rough drawing. I literally try and take one minute to do a drawing of what it is there. Oh, I'm drawing a D&D game and it's the Beholder. I'm like, I know what a beholder is. It's a giant ball with an eye on it and a bunch of tentacles out it. Done. Okay. Now I'm doing an ogre. I'm like, oh, okay. It's like a big rough guy, <laughs> you know, done. Right. I'm doing a little goblin. Oh, okay. It's a little, little guy. Uh, you know, I'm doing gelatinous cube because it's a D&D game. Like, okay. Th it's a cube. Done. Um, what is, oh, this is a chest. Okay. Draw a chest. Oh, this is like a, whatever it is. I just do it. Bang, 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 bang. Literally try and get the whole thing done in like a few hours. Um, get all the reference I need for it, right? And, and really try and just get, okay, now I've got a picture of what it is. It's the same for my comic. What I want is at least a blank version of all the stuff I need to do. Now you may have a different way you do this, but the way I do it is once I have a storyboard, um, I, once I kind of, you know, have a process for creating the storyboard, could be a million ways you could do it. You could do it in your sketchbook, scan it in, um, you know, sort of resize it. So you've got this really rough, um, sketch in your sort of Photoshop file or whatever, you know, um, clip studio or whatever process you use for creating pages. Um, and, uh, you know, you can then, uh, you know, sort of finish that storyboard, figure out whatever process you need to take it to the next stage it would be your sort of drawing. Then you might have another folder that's for lines and color. And all I do is like once I'm finished with the storyboard phase of a particular book, then I just sort of uh, save it as um, and, I, and I call it like version two. And I then save that next version of it in the sort of finished lines folder. And then, you know, I kind of move all these things progressively through. Um, until I have a version of it as a storyboard, version of it as lines, version of it as color. That's how I do it. Um, and uh, But that's because I start with all of the files being high res, proper resolution. Um, you could start with just kind of having a storyboard and you could work on your storyboard at sort of lower resolution. You could then copy it into you know another template, whatever. There's a million ways. The, the point is you have blank versions of these files, right? Blank versions of the things that don't have anything on it. And then your goal as you progress is to just make sure you have enough of these, enough deliverables, and you know all the things you need to create. And then what I would suggest is to put rough versions or as quickly as possible, put rough versions or indications of what the actual finished thing should be on there. So you're building this thing out and you're building a very rough version of it. Now, you're saying, why should this be important, right? It's important here to be super specific about what you're doing because this will actually give you confidence to know that what you're doing is important and what you're doing is actually going to get there. If you don't have a good visualization for what's going to you know, be in your actual finished product, then it can be a massive challenge to finish it. This helps you visualize as you progress through your project how much of it is there. We're visual people as artists, I imagine. 
it's good to be able to see I have half my storyboard done. How do I know that? I can look at a folder and I can see that half of them are blank, half of them have a storyboard. Likewise, I can see, right, I've done all my lines, right? I've got this folder, it's all full. I don't have any color or maybe I've finished like this much color. Right? You can literally see chunks of files finished or not finished and you get a feeling for like how many chunks uh, is in your finished project um, and sort of how you're progressing. Um, and I think, again, just working on upgrading those assets and deliverables is important. So, you know, you have the file names and you just kind of could quickly sort of work on it. Um, I think this is a really good way to do it and it allows you to visualize your progress as you go. Now, I guess the question here is that, you know, like what? why do I have to do all of this stuff, right? Like why, why do I have to do it in the beginning? It can be very challenging in the beginning to do this if you haven't done projects before because you don't know actually all the deliverables you need. But what this will tell you is a couple of things. The first is it'll tell you what you do and don't know about the process. If you haven't thought about what you're actually delivering, if you haven't thought about the stages along the way, it's very unlikely you're actually going to get there in the end anyway because you probably are going to get halfway through and it's going to feel overwhelming and the easiest thing to do is quit. The other concept that's really important to grasp here is yes, it feels like in the beginning you should just be like energy, energy, energy. I'm going to make this amazing thing. And you don't want to dampen that, right? This is like the ultimate sort of, um, you know, sort of wet towel, right? It's kind of like a wet blanket of, of misery to be like, oh, now you've got to figure out all the stuff in your process. Don't be too creative. But the thing is that when you do have that energy in the beginning is where you actually want to be dealing with this stuff. A lot of projects fail because people get to the middle of the project and you're in the messy middle, the valley of despair, of desolation. You can't see the light at the end of the tunnel yet. Things are not working uh, and you've just got so long to go and all of that initial creative energy is gone. It's well gone. It's months gone and you're still kind of trunging through the middle of just making this thing. Um, and you're not even sure that it's going to be good. You're not even sure. You know, it just feels like it's going to go on forever. If you sort of encounter major structural problems with your project at that point where you're like, I don't even know what resolution this should be. Maybe you have accidentally chosen the wrong resolution. Firstly, you know, that's going to be a massive problem. But also, you know, if you haven't really figured out all the different bits you need for the finish, and you encounter a couple of problems, what it means is you're not only just sludging through the middle, but when you come to that project, you've got to fix those problems. And that can be a massive turnoff for you completing a project. I, I would recommend and posit to you that the number one thing that will allow you to complete a long project is that when you are in the middle, you know all you've got to do is keep going. You know that you just have to create, keep creating content, keep drawing pages, keep going, trust the work you did before, trust that if you just keep going, you'll get to the end and you'll have all these things finished. It's so important. If you're trying to second guess yourself about like, oh, maybe I didn't actually do enough research to figure out how this thing's going to go in the beginning, are you doing that in the middle? It's very easy to burn out and to feel like every time you touch or think about the project, you just think about the problems, the million things that are wrong with it. What you want to be dealing with in the middle is just moving forward one step at a time and making sure you've done all this stuff in the beginning is the number one way you can do that. And as I said, you're going to have to do it anyway. It's very hard to avoid figuring out what you actually need to deliver your finished product. And it's very challenging with a lot of these things to change stuff in the halfway through. It's hard to change the aspect ratio of your book. Um, it's hard to, you know, change the way you're doing some particular thing with your file. It's hard for me to change the design of how the cards look halfway through after I've done half of them, if I'm doing a board game or something. So you have to get it right in the beginning anyway. You have to think about these things. If you think about it and you realize you don't know anything about this and this is too complicated, then that's a good signal that you should probably figure this out. Secondly, if you get halfway through figuring out what deliverables you need in your project, and then you realize, man, I really don't know enough about this. That's a good way that you can go and take that to someone and say, hey, Tim, I'm trying to make a comic book. These are the things I think I need. What am I missing? That's going to be so much easier for me to ping you back and say, oh, you're missing this and that and this 
right? Um, you know, and you really need to figure out this, these five things, right? If you have a set of deliverables and you really thought through it, it gives you an idea about what you don't know. And that's going to allow you to go and look for what is the right resolution? How many pages do I need? How does this actually get printed? How does this work? You're going to have questions to ask. And again, you're much better off doing these in the beginning because that's when you have that energy and it feels like, you know, anything's possible. So that's my recommendation essentially is like see it come alive as you progress, right? See the, you know, see the muscles, the sinew get placed on, you know, the legs and the, the arms that, you know, a bit at a time. You see the skin go on, you see the clothes go on and then fi finally it's finished, right? Um, it's good to see it come alive this way because it gives you confidence. You know the scope of it. You know when it's going to be finished. If you're going through the middle and you're not quite sure when it's even going to be finished, that's the worst. At least this way, you can see the light at the tunnel even when it feels like you're not, right? There's feeling like you can't see the end and then there's really having no idea where you are. If you can visually see, oh, okay, like it feels like I've been going forever, but I still haven't finished the storyboards. At least you know where you are. It feels like you've got forever to go. It feels like you'll never get it done, but you know, like, okay, I just need to do five more times this much effort, right? And then it'll be done. Just knowing that can often be the difference between you finishing it and just giving up halfway through. The second thing here that I think is really important is a little bit more of a sort of mental sort of, you know, mind frame style thing. And that's just to expect friction. When you go from the point, if you've sort of done this for the first time and you're really sort of thinking about creating projects and maybe you've done a few that haven't worked, you're trying to figure out how this sort of functions, you've got a new idea. It's important to understand that there is going to be friction at the point where you turn your idea and it goes purely from idea space and you start to actually produce assets that people are going to see. So we can think about parts of your process that are very much linked to thinking. And this for me would be like, oh, I'm doing little character sketches. Oh, I'm doing a little synopsis for my comic. I'm thinking about what it's going to be and it's going to be great. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be my best work ever. I can totally see it in my head. Everyone's going to love me. It's going to be the best comic ever. I'll go down as like, you know, the most amazing comic artist in history it's all good until I actually start creating pages and those pages are not development work. Those pages are things people are actually going to see. And at that point, that's when it's like, oh, <laughs> oh no, right? All of that reality that was kind of potentiality, optimism, positivity, creative energy turns into us kind of looking at it and going, even if it's just 1%, not as good as you wanted, even if it's different, it could be great, but it's not exactly what you had in mind. This is where that friction of an idea becoming real can really hit home. And it's just important to understand that from my experience, that is a perfectly natural part of the creative process. And it's really rough in the beginning, especially on your first few projects when you see that happen it can be very disheartening because all of a sudden you start to see the project that you're actually creating and not this fantasy project that's kind of in your head, right? And I think that can be a big shock to people. It's just important to grasp that this is how things work. We have an idea in our head, but, you know, that's not necessarily how it's going to turn out. And you have to manage that. You do have to have your plan, your skeleton, your, you know, this is my grand scheme. And you've got your aspirations for what it's going to be. And then as you start to create it, you see how all those things are actually playing out. And you do need to maybe adjust a little bit, you know, tweak things a little bit. But mostly what you need to understand is just that this is normal, right? Um, you know, this is the difference and often between, you know, how sort of like professional people, you know, move forward with their work um, versus, you know, just doing a little sort of personal project that, you know, kind of doesn't really go anywhere is, you know, it's often that ability to push forward and, and move forward when it comes to these projects. And, and this is something that like, I'm not necessarily saying that, you know, I get this right all the time. And this is what we'll do within the, the third point below that I think is really sort of critical is that, you know, I have created many, many projects that don't go anywhere. It's not that every project I create goes somewhere. I frequently, one of the reasons I'm talking about this is because I've seen the difference between how I approach things and what I get out of it and how successful it is. But 
if I look at often if I'm creating work that's just sort of personal project and it's just me kind of messing around and often, you know, I'm kind of thinking of creating something, but again, we'll talk about this in the, in the third stage, but I'm kind of also just wanting to motivate myself to create work, to experiment. And I don't always necessarily have some, because I have created projects in the past personally, I don't have some desire or need for it to go nowhere. If it, if it kind of peters out, it's not, I, I know that I could do it if I wanted. Let's, let's put it that way. But often the difference between me sort of actually completing something is just pushing through that initial discomfort. So frequently, you know, I would just be doing test pages again for a comic or, you know, I've got some idea and I've got this sort of great idea. And it, if it's kind of something where I'm, I'm really after trying to find a particular look or a feel, or maybe I'm just using this project as a way to explore um, my own process and see like, I wonder whether it would work if I did this, if my skeleton looked like this and maybe I tried it this way, like maybe for instance, I didn't do a storyboard or, or I just kind of started at page one and kept going, or, you know, maybe if I tried to compress things in this particular way and then I just kind of try it. And, it, and if it kind of fails, I'm like, uh, I, I, maybe that's not the best idea. Maybe I'll try again. Um, there's many different reasons why you might succeed, but the number one thing that I've noticed is that whenever I actually start a project and it goes from idea to reality, there's an immense amount of friction. And it's often having the project as a professional gig where I'm getting paid, right? I need to do this. I need to turn up. It's often that difference that actually means it gets made and I get to the other side of that friction and things actually start to work in some way, shape or form. Most times when I start a project, the first page, the first card, the first thing is not working. It's not good enough. It's not what I expected. And I know it's not really going to live up to my aspirations. And for instance, you know, I've worked on quite a number of little comic book projects myself that no one's ever seen where I've just been playing around and, you know, engaging in that creative uh, inspiration. And doing the things that I'm suggesting you not do, where you just kind of have an idea and you just kind of start and it kind of peters out. Versus like, you know, when I started the, you know, Star Atlas comic book, for instance, is this was a situation where, you know, I had a solid, I had a pretty good idea of what it was going to look like. And I'd pitched people within the company like, hey, this is what this comic's going to look like. This, these are the kind of all the things we have as aspirations for it. But you know, when it first actually starts coming out, there's a lot of issues, right? There's some things that I'd sort of missed. And you kind of realize as soon as you start those first pages, like, oh, that's right, I should have done more work on the character design. Haven't really figured out how to create and properly draw this character, right? Again, if you're looking on the video one, that's the character behind me. Um, I just kind of really hadn't figured out. And it's kind of doing those first few pages where you kind of realize like, oh, these are the 10 or 20 things that I missed in my skeleton. If you're a professional, you've done this a few times, that's how you will identify. That's how I view it. I'm like, oh, I should have done this earlier, but I'm doing it now and I'm getting paid. So I have to I have to progress, I have to fix those problems on the fly. Um, and I think it's just, you know, the difference is that I have to, right? The difference between it getting made is that I have to. And often that's really useful. So if your goal is, and this is what we'll talk about in, in a little bit, if your goal is to finish it and what you really need is the confidence that you can finish a project and you want to see what it looks like when you create a project, then you have to just sort of push through that initial friction and understand that that's normal. That's what everyone goes through. And it's just a natural part of the creative process that there's going to be a lot of good stuff that happens. Once you kind of figure out how everything's going, you get all your sort of systems functioning a bit better, learn how to draw the characters, learn your process, um, and, you know, figure out, you know, how to get closer to your original vision as you sort of, you know, build it one page or card or step or illustration or page of your art book at a time. All right. So the third thing here that I think is really, really important and is very much going to be related to how happy you are with this process is figuring out how you define success working on your project. Now, there's many ways actually that I think you really have to look at this and imagining, the big mistake I think is imagining that you haven't done a project before and you're going to complete it. You're going to complete it on time. It's going to be this amazing thing that perfectly represents your vision, that it's going to be perfectly commercially successful. Everyone's going to love it. Everyone's going to buy it. It's going to make you a millionaire. 
you're also imagining it's going to have the highest quality possible and that it's really going to show the very best that you can do. It's extremely challenging to do all those things on one project. And I think the reality is that often we need to have different and pretty clear goals about why we're doing something or at least a priority list of what is the most important thing about this project. I think there's a couple of ways we could easily define success here. Yours may be the same as these or they may be different, but I think having one clear goal is critical to you being able to actually start a project well and know where you're going with it. We could think about success as just being able to complete it. You're able to complete the project and therefore you have succeeded. doesn't matter how good it is. doesn't matter whether anyone likes it. You've done it. Therefore, tick, it is a success. And I think that's probably the best way to view it in the beginning because Learning how to do this is very, very much a skill. And I think the more you build this skill, the better at it you'll get. You need to have this experience. So that's certainly one way you could view it. The other thing you could sort of view this as is an experimentation. And that's something that I have frequently done, as I was saying, where I would kind of start a project really just as a way to give myself something to do. And I'm giving it structure and a framework and I'm sort of trying to see where it will go. And often what I am playing with are these frameworks, these skeletons. I'm thinking, well, if I did this and this and this, if I only, if I skipped this step, what would happen? How would it look if I made things much simpler, if I made things more complicated, if I didn't write a script, if I just kind of jumped into it, maybe if I wrote it this way. Maybe if I, um, you know, did the storyboards in my sketchbook, maybe if I did it like it doesn't really matter to me at this point, whether or not this thing comes out or succeeds because I've done this before. I do know how it sort of works. What I'm mostly interested in is refining the process or developing the style. And sometimes I know that the only way you can really get a feel for that is to practice it in the field. So I will just start drawing comic book pages or I'll start prototyping a book or something like that. And I'll kind of see what's happening, whether that sort of process seems like, yes, this is going to work. Or again, often what happens is I realize I needed to plan more. This process I'm using isn't going to work or whatever. Either way, the real goal I have is just to be able to do stuff, to experiment, to play around with different ideas. And I'm not typically concerned with the quality um, or whether it turns out. I just want a channel and a way that I can sort of put my creative energy that's not just in me doing sketchbook work or doing random illustrations. I want a larger project and I want to sort of attack it. And these can often just be also really you can build these into your sort of initial pitch. You have a go at it, then you retreat and you're like, okay, I need to work on this better. This stuff is just concept art now, right? It doesn't really relate to the finished product. Um, And I think it can be, you know, perfectly viable to just kind of jump in as long as you have the expectation that this is an experimentation, right? This is not something where you're expecting this to go really well and you're going to, you know, get frustrated if it doesn't. So I think that's perfectly acceptable. Um, Complete is good experiment is good. The other thing we can do is quality, right? You may really want and need this thing to be top quality for whatever that means. It, it's, it's an expression of your quality, right? And the best you can do and that that's actually important. You may be wanting to use this kind of as a portfolio piece and it doesn't really matter how long it takes. You may not even need to finish it. You may just have this thing half finished and you're sharing the process and that gets you a job or it gets you a job doing something else. Either way, you can really have as a priority that this thing is going to be the best thing I could possibly do. Hang the cost, um, you know, it doesn't matter, but, you know, I just need this thing to be the best it possibly can be. The other thing, obviously, that's important that you could have as a goal is this thing needs to be a commercial success. Again, if I'm making my tabletop games, I think, you know, one of the primary things we're focusing on there is can we get the Kickstarter to go? right? Can we get enough money through the Kickstarter to manufacture it? And then like, will we be able to sell more copies of it? Because this is how we're justifying the time that we're putting into it, right? Not just we're kind of doing it for fun, but also like if we can't at least make it pay or we put all this energy into it and then, you know, the the Kickstarter, we don't get the marketing right or something like that, then there's no point to it. So there's a lot of these projects and this is like most projects you probably work on as a job. I like this where the goal really is to make a viable product that's going to people are going to want. And that doesn't always mean that, you know, you get it done on a particular time and you just kind of, you know, ship it even though it's average. Um, That means you really have to think about what people are actually wanting. It also doesn't mean that you just 
focus on getting 100% quality with everything. Now, people who are not in the creative field may think that's the case, but the reality is often when people pursue perfection with these larger projects, they never come out. And then by the time they do come out, they're underwhelming because they're outdated or they've been overworked. Or again, it just kind of doesn't feel fresh. It's not always, you know, that pursuing perfect quality is the ideal. It often depends how much experience with the other stuff you've had. But often you need to think about what people are actually going to value. And in that case, again, it's important to prioritize those things over, you know, you noodling and making sure you get your art perfect. Um, or again, just kind of trudging through and making sure you complete it. Often you do need to consider what's important. And that's probably the conversation for another day. Um, we can unpack that further. But again, there's different ways that you can view these projects. And some ways that you view them are going to be more or less likely for it to succeed, but your goal may not for it always to be succeed. To succeed, it may just be to be a vessel for your creative energy. And as I said, I've often done different things, um, and I have many projects that haven't gone anywhere, and I've got you know probably a far less number of projects that I've taken to completion. So the key here and the bottom line is that you have to figure out what is going to drive you here why you're actually doing this thing and how you're going to feel happy about completing it. And as you do progress, pay attention to that and really think about, you know, um, whether or not this is making you happy and remind yourself, look, I just need to finish this. And if I just finish this, that's what I'm going to define as success. And I think that's a really good thing to do in the beginning. Likewise, you might have, um, a completely different goal. And it's important to understand those and follow those because that's what's going to make you feel good. Again, as you're trudging through the messy middle, right, the valley of despair where you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, you just got to know, oh, I just got to finish this. Or look, if I just finish this, if I just get this right, if I get this perfect, then I know I'll have this great portfolio piece, this set of um, you know images or something that are going to take me to the next level career-wise or just be something cool I can you know print out um, sell at conventions, like whatever it is your goal is, right? You just may want to do it for yourself, right? In which case you're just proving to yourself you can create something that is high quality. Either way, if you know what these things are in the beginning, you'll be happy with the outcome. And there's no point if you haven't really set yourself up to complete something by skeletoning it properly, by really being serious about what you're doing. If you're not doing that in the beginning, don't have expectation that you're going to be able to finish it, right? Because planning in the beginning is a major part of delivering and completing something. So the way you think about this is very much going to define your happiness. And I think as an artist, that's one of the most important things. All right. So again, hopefully that makes sense. I mean, let me know in the comments down below whether these ideas resonate with you. The reality is that there are major emotional problems that you will face when you know you're dealing with these it's just a huge challenge to do this right but before we go what i want to do is do a few really simple takeaways so that we can try and consolidate this advice and think about how you might actually be able to use it in your projects the first takeaway that i always like to do is an analytical takeaway if we sort of step back and really look at what's going on here i think there's two key ideas the first is that you need to start by kind of knowing where you're going and you need to start by knowing what your expectations are, where you're and why you're doing this. And I think if you can figure out those two things, a lot of this will become a lot more enjoyable. And as you progress, you'll get better and better at figuring out what actually goes into a project. And as you do a few of them, you complete a few of them, you get a really good understanding of how this planning works for you. It's critical to understand that, you know, the specific way that you create one of these projects is very unique. The way you plan it, the way you create steps along the way, milestones, the feelings that you have, and the way that you manage the emotional journey is very specific to you. And part of doing this is figuring that out. The more you figure that out, as you start projects, you have a clearer idea of, okay, where do I want this to go? Um, and why am I doing it? And I think the more you do that, the more fun you're going to have. If you want a really simple bro level takeaway, just how can we sum this up in a couple of words? I'd say even if you plan to not have a plan, 
then that's still something you need to plan well to do. I, even if you're just going in with chaotic intentions, don't really know what I'm going to do. I just got all this energy. I'm just going to do something. You need to know that that is your plan. You need to expect that this is probably going to go pear shaped, that this is a good way for you to experiment and dive in. But, you know, look, if you haven't really planned it properly, it can be risky to just, you know, um, trek through the sludge and, you know, keep messing around because you don't really know where you're going. You don't know why you're there. You haven't got a plan. You haven't got a map. You haven't got a skeleton. You don't know what your deliverables are. You don't even know what you're doing. So, you know, it can be a situation where you just trudge along forever there in the darkness and you never find anything. You do need the plan to begin with. So planning is key. Even when you don't have a plan, that's still a plan and you need to make sure that you have a good plan for doing that. Hopefully that makes sense. If we look at super practical takeaways, like what could you actually do? How do you actually manifest this? Well, the first thing here is pretty simple. It's kind of what we've been talking about. Define what you're making, like really figure out like, what am I doing? What is the project? We often think about this again, kind of like I was saying, it's just, it's something I'm doing. I'm just building a world. I'm doing some vague thing. If you're being vague, if you're just building a world, then define that exactly as what you're doing. Even if it's a vague thing, define it. If it is something specific, if it's an actually a, a comic or a printed product, something you're going to have manufactured, something you're going to print at home, something you know that you're going to display on a screen, could be a digital project, could be a video game, who knows. Either way, figure out what exactly it is and to the best of your ability, figure out all the things that you're going to need to build to make it happen. And you're much better off doing this in the beginning. So really figure out and create a picture of what you're doing. And the second thing is to basically build a blank version of that as much as possible. As much as you can build a structure and a skeleton, a framework for all of those things, but just make them blank. Now, this could be, if you're making a card game, simply a matter of buying a whole bunch of blank cards, cutting up a bunch of blank stuff, and then just kind of writing the name of whatever you're dealing with. This is often from a design principles point of view called wireframing or doing that kind of very initial design pass where you kind of figure out what, it's, what, what needs to be there, but you don't actually put any art, you don't build any assets. Again, for a comic book, we often call this kind of like a proof. Um, back in the old sort of printing days where people would literally say, okay, you know, this is what the finished book is going to look like, but it wouldn't have anything on it. It would just sort of show you like this is the format, this is how many pages, this is how it's going to be bound, this is the paper that's going to be on it. And, you know, this is kind of showing them like this is what you're going to get. You just need to tell me what goes on those pages. And obviously then you build the proof as well, you know, with art on it. But, you know, initially we're often just mocking up things, right? And this is a fundamental part of design um, process is to kind of just build this there, right? If you're building a, often people recommend if you're building a children's storybook that you literally build it, right? You literally print it out or create a little sketch version of it that you can flip through because that gives you a good understanding of like, oh, this is what I'm making. Then when you're in the weeds of drawing the art and, you know, painting all those bits and pieces in detail, you know that the thing that you're creating is going to be real, right? It makes it real to create mock-ups, skeletons, frameworks, and blank versions of what you're doing. It may seem silly in the beginning, but this is often what will save you in the middle and will actually allow you to get to the end. Lastly, if you're thinking about your project, consider and write down what your musts are. Really figure out on a priority level what your goals and what the outcome you want. What is your expectation of this? You can list it as a, set, as a set of priorities. It doesn't always need to be like, I only want quality. I only want it to be commercial. But really figure out what needs to be there for you to feel happy about working on this. And I think if you can define that early on, it kind of guides everything in a very subtle way. Lastly, if we look at a philosophical, spiritual takeaway here, I think the frustrating thing for me is that I can tell, hopefully, again, let me know that a lot of the things I'm saying here seem very technical and this can feel antithetical to the feeling of being artistic and creative. But it's also important to understand that doing this is a skill. Building your artistic projects and figuring out how to manage yourself and your ideas through space and time all of these things are actually very complicated. I mean, if you actually break it down, it's not easy to do all of these steps. And what you're trying to do over a long career, over a long sort of lifetime of experience is perfect your ability to do this very, very challenging thing. And even though that initial inspiration and sort of spark of energy is, is important, 
It is also important to understand that finishing these projects is a major way that you are going to sort of complete a creative loop. You're going to finish it, be able to observe, this is the thought I had, this is the process I used, this is the final result, and that is the finished thing. And once you do that, it directly influences your ability to come up with the next idea. It's that you have a clearer image, clearer set of expectations, clearer understanding of what the skeleton should be and how you're actually going to plan this. And eventually, the planning becomes almost non-existent. You just kind of have very systemized ways of doing this and you just get to focus on creating the art. But until you've done this, you and until you finish and until you plan things so that you can finish, it's very hard actually to you know, feel good about that creative energy and feel like, oh, I have this creative energy and I know it's going to go somewhere. I know that this energy is going to be something that I can channel and manifest into a finished product. If you never go through this process and handle and manage these technical aspects of cre of creating projects, then you can always feel a little bit creatively stifled because you have that feeling of like, oh, I've got a great idea, but uh, I'm never able to make it into a product. I'm never able to finish that. I've tried 10 times and it's always failed. So, you know, maybe I won't. And, and that can dampen that excitement, right? That energy you have in the beginning. You don't want to just constantly create things and not finish them. It's often this process and dealing with the challenges and the technical aspects of our life as artists that really, you know, makes us able to be the most creative. And this hasn't changed since the very beginning. There's always been very technical aspects of being an artist. Thinking about how to mix the paint when you're a caveman, right, is challenging. It's not all sitting there doing art. It's probably a lot of it is collecting different pigments from around the place. As, you know, a painter back in the day of the old masters, you had to physically learn the chemistry of how to mix colors, We've always had these technical limitations, these things that are not us doing art. If you were Michelangelo, you know, sculpting the David, you would have to think about all the technical aspects of how do I actually get this stone here? How do I move around it? How do I get up there? There's a million technical aspects that are part of creating something great. And it's our ability to master that and the creative side of it that is more likely to enable you to create really great work. Anyway, that's all we've got time for on this particular episode. Let me know whether this helped you, inspired you, maybe scared you off a little bit about the complexity that can often be involved in, you know, taking these projects and, and pushing them to, to the completion. The number one tip I'll just leave you with is obviously you can just make a very simple project in the beginning to practice all of this stuff. And that is probably my number one takeaway here that I kind of forgot to mention earlier. Make your project really simple. Make a three-page comic. Make a five-page comic. Make a you know set of playing cards. Something where you know most of the things that are involved. You you have a really good handle on all of the different elements there because people have done it before. It's you know doesn't require a whole bunch of planning. Pick something really simple in the beginning. I'm going to create a series of three prints. I'm going to make a very small sketchbook where all I'm going to do is scan my best sketches for the year, right? And I'm going to collate them. This will still give you a feeling for all of this stuff. It'll give you a taste for how to do it. And once you get that taste, I think you start to think and imagine a better and more impressive project. So start small, start simple, kiss, keep it simple, stupid is a really, really good way to go with this. But uh, anyway, other than that, I think we're done here. I will see you on the next one.